Hello ladies and gentlemen. Today we're going to talk about plate tectonics and it's the beginning of all the really cool fun ooh, wow stuff of earth science, um, at least the geology part of earth science, um, because we're going to start talking about earthquakes and volcanoes and all sorts of fun stuff. Okay, so let's start off with the evolution of views about the origins of how the oceans were formed, where our uh, continental shapes came from, etc. Before the 19th century AD, the most common view was that all Earth features formed during the origin of the planet, in other words, the creation, and are mostly unchanged since then. But even the ancient Greeks were, even, were aware of the fossil remains of marine organisms near the tops of mountains. So the question is, how'd they get there? The Pacific Ocean Basin formed when the moon was ripped away from the Earth. The size of the Pacific Ocean Basin is just larger than the diameter of the moon. Vertical tectonics means that the surface of the Earth goes up and down over long time intervals due to unknown processes acting deep in the Earth. So again, this is what the 19th century folks believed. Since the 16th century, as better and better maps were being developed, people began to notice that the eastern margins of the Americas looked very much like the western margins of Europe and Africa. So the question became uh, popular in could they have been joined? In 1912, Alfred Wegener proposed that several continents now separated by major ocean basins had been much closer together about 300 million years ago and had been part of a single supercontinent called Pangaea. About 200 million years ago, Pangaea split into two new continents called Laurasia and Gondwana. Laurasia included North America, Europe, and Asia, and Gondwana included South America, Africa, India, Australia, and Antarctica. Some of the points of evidence for continental drift was the puzzle-like fit of the continents, which you can see looking at any map. The distinctive rock units on different continents match when they're put together. Mountain ranges on different continents match when put together. Distinctive fossils also occur on several di different continents. And Permian glacial deposits only make sense if Pangaea existed. But there's some problems with continental drift. There's no reasonable geologic way to do it, for example. The theory envisioned that continents sli were sliding over the mount mantle. But geophysical data indicated that crustal rocks would shatter if they're pushed like this. So the result was continental drift was not generally accepted. So instead, as a result, we developed paleomagnetism, or that concept. It's a new way to study Earth history and tectonics. The average magnetic field directions at one time all point toward the North Pole. So a sequence of paleomagnetic directions shows the evidence of the magnetic polarity reversal. In the course of measuring paleomagnetism, it became clear that the Earth's magnetic field has flipped polarity in the past. It seems to take about 4,000 years to do so, and field intensity decreases right before it flips. Marine geophysical surveys during and since World War II have consistently noted linear magnetic anomalies in the oceanic crust termed the marine magnetic anomalies. Marine magnetic anomalies always run parallel to the mid-ocean ridges. Marine magnetic anomaly patterns are symmetric on both sides of each ridge. Magnetic stripes reflect times when the Earth's magnetic field is alternately normal and reverse polarity, locked into rocks as they form. Fracture zones relieve the stress of oceanic crust as it moves away from the ridges, and trenches are places where the oceanic crust is being pushed back down into the mantle. The interior of the Earth is divided into layers based on the chemical and physical properties. The Earth has an outer silica-rich solid crust, a highly viscous mantle, and a core comprising liquid outer core that is much less viscous than the mantle, and a solid inner core. Working from the center of the Earth out, we have the inner core, which is a primarily solid sphere of about 1,220 kilometers in radius, situated at the Earth's center. 
Based on the abundance of chemical elements in the solar system, their physical properties, and other chemical constraints regarding the remainder of Earth's volume, the inner core is believed to be composed primarily of a nickel-iron alloy with small amounts of some unknown elements. The temperature in the inner core is estimated at 5 to 6,000 degrees Celsius and the pressure to be about 330 to 360 uh, GPA, which is over 3 million times that of the atmosphere at sea level. The liquid outer core is 2300 kilometers thick and like the inner core composed of a nickel iron alloy but with less iron than the solid inner core. Seismic and other geophysical evidence indicates that the outer core is so hot that metals are in a liquid state. The mantle is approximately 2,900 kilometers thick and comprises 70% of the Earth's volume. The core makes up about 30% of the Earth's volume, which means that the outer crust where we live is less than 1%. The mantle is divided into sections based on changes in its elastic properties with depth. In the mantle, temperatures range between 500 to 900 degrees Celsius at the upper boundary with the crust to over 4,000 degrees Celsius at the lower boundary with the core. Due to the temperature difference between the Earth's surface and outer core and the ability of the crystalline rocks at high pressures and temperatures to undergo slow, creeping, viscous-like deformation over millions of years, there is a convective material circulation in the mantle, which is called mantle convection cells. Hot material will rise up as the mantle plumes like a lava lamp, while cooler and heavier material sinks downward to be reheated and rise up again. We'll see that this process is very important to plate tectonic motion. The outermost layer is the crust. This is the most familiar to us as it is where we live. The distinction between crust and mantle is based on chemistry, rock types, and seismic characteristics. The Earth has two different types of crust, continental and oceanic. Each has different properties and therefore behaves in different ways. Continental crust forms the land, the continents, as the name suggests, that we see today. Continental crust averages about 35 kilometers thick. Under some mountain chains, crustal thickness is approximately twice that to about 70 kilometers thick. The mountains we see on Earth have deep roots in the crust that we can't see. The crust floats on the more dense mantle, and like how only the tip of an iceberg sticks up out of the water, we only see the tip of the continental crust, the mountain ranges. Continental crust is less dense and therefore more buoyant than oceanic crust. Continental crust contains some of the oldest rocks on Earth. Ancient rocks exceeding 3.5 billion years in age are found on all of Earth's continents. The oldest rocks on Earth found so far are the Acasta Nices in northwestern Canada near Great Slave Lake. Um, they're 4.03 billion years old. And the Isua supercrustal rocks in West Greenland, 3.7 to 3.8 billion years old. But well-studied rocks nearly as old are also found in the Minnesota River Valley in the U.S., 3.5 to 3.7 billion years, in Swaziland, 3.4 to 3.5, and in Western Australia, 3.4 to 3.6 billion years of age. As the name for oceanic crust already suggests, the crust is below the oceans. Compared to continental crust, oceanic crust is very thin. It's only 6 to 11 kilometers thick. It is more dense than continental crust, and therefore when the two types of crust meet, oceanic crust will sink underneath the continental crust. The rocks of the oceanic crust are very young, compared with most of the rocks of the continental crust. They are not older than about 200 million years old. So if you look at a map of the world, you may notice that some of the continents could fit together like the pieces of a puzzle. The shape of Africa and South America are a good example. This is because they did used to fit together. The Earth as we see it today was not always like it is now. Land masses have pulled apart and joined together by the process we call plate tectonics. There are 12 major plates on Earth, each of which slide around at a rate of centimeters per year, pulling away from, scraping against, or crashing into each other. Each type of interaction produces a characteristic tectonic feature, like mountain ranges, volcanoes, and or rift valleys that we will be discussing during this lecture.
This diagram shows the major tectonic plates, and you can see the 12. Plates are made of rigid lithosphere, formed of the crust and the extreme upper mantle. The asthenosphere beneath the lithosphere is the part of the upper mantle and is so hot that if 1 to 5% liquid, this liquid usually at the junctions of crystals allow it to flow, which is why asteno means weak. Beneath the asthenosphere is the rest of the mantle, which is completely solid, but it can also flow on geological time scales because the intense temperatures and pressures involved. The base of the lithosphere asthenosphere boundary corresponds approximately to the depth of the melting pressure or melting temperature of the mantle. The question of how tectonic plates are moved around the globe is answered by understanding mantle convection cells. In the mantle, hot material rises toward the lithosphere like hot air rising out of an open oven. If you've ever opened an oven door and felt the blast of hot air coming past your face, then you know what I'm talking about. The hot material reaches the base of the lithosphere where it cools and sinks back down through the mantle. The cool material is replaced by more hot material and so on, forming a large convection cell, as you can see in this diagram. This slow but incessant movement in the mantle causes the rigid tectonic plates to move or float around the Earth's surface at an equally slow rate. We're now going to talk about the processes that occur at the plate tectonic boundaries. So what happens when the plates meet? Firstly, there are three types of plate boundary, each related to the movement seen along the boundary. Divergent boundaries are where plates move away from one another. Convergent boundaries are where the plates move toward each other, and transform boundaries are where the plates slide past each other. In plate tectonics, a divergent boundary is a linear feature that exists between two tectonic plates that are moving away from each other. These areas can form in the middle of continents or on the ocean floor. As the plates pull apart, hot molten material can rise up in this newly formed pathway to the surface, causing volcanic activity. Where a divergent boundary forms on a continent is called a rift or continental rift, such as the African Rift Valley that you see here in this picture. Where a divergent boundary forms under the ocean, it's called an ocean ridge. This map shows the ocean ridge in the oceanic crust. So you can see that as the ocean plates are spreading apart, magma will rise up in that center and then it will fill in the oceanic crust with more magma from the, from the bottom. And you can see some recently erupted basalt in the lower picture. If you take a look at Iceland, you can see that this is also a divergent boundary. It runs straight through Iceland. It's located right on top of the divergent boundary, and in fact, the island exists solely because of this feature. As the North American and Eurasian plates are pulled apart, volcanic activity occurred along the cracks and fissures. With many eruptions over time, the island grew out of the sea. Convergent boundaries are where plates move toward each other. There are three types of convergent boundary, each defined by what type of crust, continental or oceanic, is coming together. Therefore, we can have continent-continent collision, continent-oceanic crust collision, or ocean-ocean collision. When continental crust pushes against continental crust, both sides of the convergent boundary have the same properties. So think back to the description of the continental crust. It's very thick and very buoyant. Neither side of the boundary wants to sink beneath the other side. And as a result, the two plates push against each other and the crust buckles and cracks, pushing up and down into the mantle high mountain ranges. For example, the European Alps and the Himalayas formed in this way. India used to be an island, but about 15 million years ago, it crashed into Asia. As continental crust was pushing against continental crust, the Himalayan mountain belt was pushed up. Mountains were also pushed down into the mantle as the normally 35 kilometer thick crust is approximately 70 kilometers thick in this region. Mountains were, uh, Mount Everest is the highest altitude mountain on our planet standing at 8840 meters high. This means that below the surface at the foot of the mountain, the crust is a further 61 kilometers deep. 
At a convergent boundary where continental crust pushes against the oceanic crust, the oceanic crust, which is thinner and more dense than the continental crust, will sink below the continental crust. This is called a subduction zone. The oceanic crust descends into the mantle at a rate of centimeters per year, and this oceanic crust is called the subducting slab. When the subducting slab reaches a depth of around 100 kilometers, it dehydrates and releases water into the overlying mantle wedge. The addition of water into the mantle wedge changes the melting point of the molten material there, forming new melt, which rises up into the overlying continental crust, forming volcanoes. Subduction is a way of recycling the oceanic crust. Eventually, the subducting slab sinks down into the mantle to be recycled. It is for this reason that oceanic crust is much younger than the continental crust, which is not recycled. The Andes mountain range along the western edge of South American continent is an example of a mountain belt formed by subduction. The continental crust of South American plate has buckled under the compressional strain of converging with the Nazca and Antarctic plates. Additionally, there are many volcanoes, the result of melting in of the subducting slab and the production of new material that has risen through the crust to the surface. When two oceanic plates converge, because they are dense, one runs over the top of the other, causing it to sink into the mantle and a subduction zone is formed. The subducting plate is bent down into the mantle to form a deep depression in the subfloor called a trench. Trenches are the deepest parts of the ocean and remain largely unexplored. Manned or unmanned submersible vehicles have explored small parts of trenches discovering new species like the fish and tube worms that you see here and amazing ecosystems. The third type of boundary are transform boundaries along which plates slide past each other. The San Andreas Fault adjacent to which the US city of San Francisco is built is an example of a transform boundary between the Pacific Plate and the North American Plate. This map summarizes all of the known plate boundaries on Earth, showing whether they are divergent, convergent, or transform boundaries. I do not expect you to memorize this map or even the names of all the plates, but I do expect you to be able to recognize when looking at a map similar to this or when I talk about trenches or subducting slabs or uh, ocean rifts or rift valleys, etc., I do expect you to be able to identify what you're looking at and what's going on there tectonically. Okay, that is the con conclusion of the plate tectonics lecture. I hope you have a great day, and if you have any questions, of course, come and see me during office hours or send me an email. Have a great day.